And welcome back to the second part of the France 24 debate. I'm Annette Young. Now, within hours of announcing the end of its military campaign against Houthi rebels in Yemen, Saudi-led coalition planes bombed the city of Taiz. Fighting is also continuing the port city of Aden and along in other flashpoints. And this all despite Riyadh declaring its month-long campaign, which sought to restore the country's president, had achieved its goals. But the surprise statement raises more questions than answers, since the deposed leader has not been restored. Not to mention Houthi fighters are still in control of the capital of Sana'a. And it all comes against a backdrop of changing alliances in the wake of that nuclear deal with Iran. Let's just take a listen to what the Iranian foreign minister had to say about the latest developments. Unfortunately, these airstrikes against Yemen by Saudi Arabia have left the Saudis in a difficult position regarding relations between regional countries. However, we believe this was a positive step. Everyone should help in the process that has been started toward political cooperation so that it can move forward and reach effective and practical results for Yemen's political situation. Now, with me to talk about the mess that is Yemen is a William Jordan, a former U.S. State Department official, Ardavan Amir Aslani, a lawyer and author of several books on Islam and Iran. From London, Ali Shihabi, a Saudi commentator. And from Washington, Barbara Slavin, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and Washington correspondent for Our Monitor. And also a reminder that you, the viewer, can join the conversation on Twitter. That's hashtag F24Debate. Now, let me start with Barbara in Washington. Mm. I imagine it's, this is leaving the Americans in a very awkward position. Yes, absolutely. Look, the United States is complicit in this Saudi operation. The U.S. has been providing uh, intelligence information, targeting information to the Saudi-led coalition, and so bears some responsibility for the civilian casualties that have occurred. At the same time, the United States wants to bolster Saudi Arabia, wants to bolster the GCC, and convince them that this upcoming nuclear deal with Iran is not going to come at their expense. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, the White House sent out a, a statement very early this morning uh, welcoming the news of the ceasefire, even though apparently it's not entirely taken effect, and calling for a political solution. And I think maybe we should talk a little bit about a political solution. Obviously, Abdullah, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh is not coming back. I don't think Hadi is coming back. But Hadi named a vice president a couple of weeks ago who might be acceptable to the Houthis. And the Iranians are certainly pushing for some sort of negotiation, some sort of political settlement. So I wonder if the other guests agree that we are headed in that direction. Adavan? No, I believe that the analysis <clears throat> is, is totally correct. I think it is the Iranian desire to have the, the uh, strikes against the Yemeni population stop as soon as possible. I believe that the Iranians are using whatever influence they have over the Houthis to push them and to compel them to sit at a table. I don't think that there's the slightest chance of any of the Saudi protégés coming back because the, mm. the, these airstrikes have managed to galvanize the entire Yemeni population against the Saudis, whether they are Houthi or not, because you've had civilian targets hit on every side. I believe that the Saudis are, are stuck in a huge quagmire, that is, and this is only the beginning. A couple of years back, they had a similar problem on the frontier with Yemen. They sent in their troops, 200 soldiers died. And I'm totally in total agreement. This maneuver is basically to scare their own Shia population into silence. One third of the Saudi population is probably Shia. All of them, or the vast majority of them, are primarily concentrated in what they call the eastern provinces, where all Saudi oil is situated. They also have an Ismaili Shia affiliated population in the south. So the Saudis are basically scared. And all of the 10,000 Saud princes remember one thing, that King Abdulaziz apparently on his deathbed warned his sons that the demise of the House of Saud will come from Yemen. So they panic as things happen in Yemen. And the Houthis, they have identified them with Iran, although all the commentaries are on this table except our colleague from London seems to seem to agree that this is a primarily intra yemenese matter. There may be some Iranian influence financially, ideologically, but it's an Yemeni issue. 
they have transformed this issue into a Sunni Shia fight. They've they've created a coalition of solely Sunni countries and against the Houthi Shiite targets. So they are trying to set up a, a theater conveying the notion in the world that they are in a fight and in a war with Iran, which is not the case here, at least. It may be the case elsewhere. It's not the case here. Ali, what would you say to that? Well, look, I, I seem to be a minority of one on this panel, so I'd just ask you to give me a little bit more time to explain uh, <laughs> my points. Uh, number one, my, my main point was that you can see Iranian involvement with the Houthi rebels through the reaction of Hezbollah. Hezbollah came out publicly. Uh, it has identified with the Houthi movement. Um, it's, it's, it is, its message shows that there is a very clear involvement. And Hezbollah is not purely political. It's a military organization, number one. Number two, I think everybody, including the kingdom, uh, fully appreciates that Yemen is a mess politically and economically. Now, there is a debate about how to go about solving that. But certainly, Iran has no role and no place there. So when Iran starts to send flights suddenly every day to, to Sana'a, when they're, you know, an Israeli commentator made a comment a week ago or a couple of weeks ago when the, when the daily flights started to come from Iran, saying, look, there are no Iranian tourists who are coming to spend their vacations in Yemen. What is the logic of having these daily flights? What is the logic of having Hezbollah get so upset and so involved if it was not, if it did not have a stake in the Houthi movement? Well, so, all the the, so the issue... No, let me, let me finish, please. The issue is that Iran has gotten involved in the backyard of Saudi Arabia in a country that is distressed. Now, oh. Yemen needs a structural solution, and I think I would personally argue, and I've argued in my book and in articles, that Yemen should be involved, brought into the GCC. That is the only long-term structural solution to the Yemeni problem. And if you don't the, solve Yemen... If, if you don't solve Yemen's economic problems you're not going to solve their political problems, whoever is heading it and whatever organization is coming there. But Iran's involvement through, the, through Hezbollah in the quagmire of Yemen scared Saudi Arabia absolutely. And I think that the fact that Saudi Arabia acted aggressively was important to message its domestic population and the um, and regional powers. Ali, at this point, let me just turn to William. The thing about the Middle East, there's always a lot of posturing, isn't there? Right. And uh, in terms of what he was, uh, what was just being said there, what would be your reaction to his statements? Well, I think uh, what uh, what we just heard uh, validates in many ways what I think is actually the Iranian objective here, which, as I said on this platform uh, a few months ago after the death of uh, Saudi King Abdullah, it's uh, Tehran knows exactly how to needle Riyadh. Mm -hmm. I mean, it knows exactly. I mean, it's. You know, it's, there's a certain thing, I mean, just sort of variation on uh, what's already been said. I mean, uh, if Yemen catches a cold, Saudi Arabia gets pneumonia. And the, the, the Iranians recognize this. And in this uh, very subtle, not very pleasant game that's, uh, that's being played out between Tehran and Riyadh, the Iranians know that, uh, that for very little cost to them, they can upset the Saudis in a major way by using Yemen. I mean, it's, it's, it just stands to reason. Um, you know, the, uh, you, you talk about posturing. I mean, I think uh, what, uh, what Ali in, uh, in London just said basically, uh, again, confirms that for the Saudi government, this has been all about messaging. So the attacks on, uh, on, on, on Yemeni targets, the attempt by Saudi Arabia to try to bring a certain amount of its muscle into, uh, into forcing, you know, either some sort of a political solution. Because I do believe that ultimately Riyadh understands and accepts that the only way, as has always been the case in Yemen, the only way you can bring some sort of momentary peace and calm to the country is by some sort of a political process uh, that gets the people to lay down their weapons long enough to, to work together. But any notion of a power-sharing deal appears to be rather sheer. I mean, when you think that the former president has the power to wreck anything that might be come up with, you've got uh, Southerners around Aden who now want independence from the mm. north, and what we haven't talked about is al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda. in the east who are definitely well, no. profiting Which from this chaos. Which is where you get into the major American uh, concern here. I, I mean, I, I think the you're absolutely right, Annette, that the, uh, you know, the, and this, this highlights that what you have going on in Yemen is a whole multiplicity of issues uh, that, that pit Yemenis against other Yemenis. I mean, Ali Abdullah Saleh is the dark force, ar arguably the Darth Vader uh, in, in Yemen, 
whose uh, who's, who's skullduggery cer- and... He was certainly not a friend of the Houthis uh, up until relatively recently. He no, he Shia. wasn't. He is a Shia. He, he, he was a Zaydi. He wasn't. He was, and he was, a clo- he was a close friend of the United States and a close friend of Saudi Arabia, except when he wasn't. And he's, he's, he's constantly played so many sides he's of the Shifting alliances all left, the right time. and centre. And, 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 and in addition, I mean, he was the man who, 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 re- who, who brought about, who used uh, very successfully used circumstances with the collapse of the Soviet Union to reunify or to unify Yemen, not taking into account the very real reasons why you had two Yemens in the first place. And this is one of the things that, that I don't think Saudi Arabia, the other countries of the GCC, and to some extent, even the United States, really want to envisage. And that is the very real need, in some ways, for Yemen to div- redivide in order to deal more effectively with threats like the al-Qaeda in the, in the Arabian Peninsula. Out of it. Just a, 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 a reminder. The Houthi, one of the reasons for which the Houthi movement was formed, and frankly, they don't need Hezbollah support because they're a rebel movement for the last four decades. They're involved in wars against the central government for four decades. One of the reasons that this group was formed was about Zaidi Shia empowerment in Yemen and also to fight the Wahhabi al-Qaeda affiliates. And even today, in the midst of this war that is going on with the 2,000 sorties of the Saudi Air Force against the Houthi people on the ground, you still have the Americans shooting out drones from Djibouti trying to target al-Qaeda people. And it is interesting to notice that the enemies of the Houthis today are basically al-Qaeda and, surprise, the Saudis. Barbara, I just want to bring you in. This is all happening against the backdrop of that nuclear deal with Iran. How is this sort of affecting the situation in Yemen? Well, you know, I think everyone has been able to compartmentalize and keep the nuclear negotiations away from this issue. But uh, I would note that uh, Mohammad Javad Zarif, the Iranian foreign minister, wrote a, an op-ed in The New York Times just a couple of days ago talking for a new consultative mechanism in the region with the GCC uh, and other countries to deal with regional issues. So I think the Iranians see the nuclear deal, and the United States also, to some extent, see it as a gateway issue that will open the door to uh, bringing the Iranians into other kinds of discussions. Now, of course, the Saudis don't like to, to hear that. Uh, I would agree, frankly, with a lot of what your Saudi commentator said. I mean, Iran is the problem, but it's also the solution to a lot of these conflicts, because it can't keep itself from messing around, frankly, in the affairs of Arab states, uh, in which it, it, it has no business. It's been part of its asymmetric uh, strategy since the revolution, a way of projecting power to deter attack against itself. And uh, it's, a, it's a technique that may have overstayed its welcome, certainly in the region, and that many people, certainly in Washington, hope will change if there is a nuclear deal. Uh, so it is connected in that way, but I don't think the nuclear negotiations themselves will be affected by Yemen. And Ali, do you have any reaction to what Barbara just was saying? No, I mean, I agree with her in that sense. I think the Iranians uh, have a regional plan, have regional political objectives, and, and it's concerning the people in the GCC and Saudi Arabia tremendously. So uh, they're going to watch with tremendous caution what's happening now, but they're going to be very wary and they have to build up their defense capabilities to be able to withstand um, what may happen in the future. And I think the fact that they you know, showed a little bit of aggressiveness towards Yemen is reassuring to their people and to their allies, frankly. But the Saudis do appear to be very nervous indeed, don't they? Especially in view of this sort of you know, proposed deal with Tehran. That, uh, Iran... Well, absolutely. I mean, they should be nervous. And, and you know, it, it, the, the, the deal with Iran is going to bring the Iranian regime into the fold. Uh, the Iranians have played their cards very intelligently, uh, and they are going to come in back, back in from the cold, if you, if, if, if you like, to put it that way. And when they do that, it's going to make them a much more formidable player in the Middle East. If you assume that Iran is a country that has, um, wants to project power across the Middle East. Now, other people might disagree with me and say, no, Iran is going to focus on, it, on its internal issues. But I think everything we've seen in the last 10 years with Iran projecting its power in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, and now in Yemen, shows that this is a regime that prioritizes its regional political objectives over its domestic welfare. Um, and, and that scares people, and that scares Saudi Arabia. Could, 
Could, could I just say one thing here? I think that what you have to look at this in terms of the situation that Iran has been in, 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 in relation to the region and also the, the adversarial relationship with the United States that's gone on so long. That has shifted. And I have now heard Iranians actually talk about normalization of relations with the United States. So there is a possibility of Iranian reorientation and a possibility that they might scale back. Obviously, we don't know at this point. But I don't think we should necessarily assume that they're going to become more aggressive regionally uh, as a result of a nuclear deal. Out of an well, I, ho I hope the you're Iranians right. The Iranians, for sure, right, are striving but Iran, to get back to their natural position. people are very scared position. of Iran. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure everybody is scared of Iran, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, this nuclear issue should be put aside. It's a different matter. It's been compartmentalized. The Iranian nation, as such, 80 million people, the dominant civilization in the Middle East. Is, is aspiring to, the, to return to its uh, how, natural how position of being able. Uh, uh, ah. Ali, just hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Ali, just hang on, and Barbara. The Iranians uh. are not entirely squeaky clean either. You in see, all of Iran. This. You see, Iran. When you look at Iran's position in the last 36 oh, years, dear. 36 years of of ostracism, 36 years of exclusion, and horrendous eight-year war with Iraq that killed half a million Iranians, having fanatic. Uh, Islamic State uh, soldiers barely on its frontiers on the Iraqi side, having the Taliban coming back uh, in Afghanistan, having all these gung ho uh, countries to the south, you know, sending out their, their planes to bomb God knows what minority today and tomorrow, they're f afraid. And I, I believe that it is only legitimate for them to, as long as they are authorized to, uh, to proceed this way, to protect themselves from outside aggression. And this thing about Iran not being authorized to look elsewhere. It's true, of course. Every foreign country's sovereignty should be protected, and this is what we should remain the Saudi government, not to go and bomb another sovereign state. It's about also Shia empowerment, something that the Houthis in Yemen are striving for. Barbara, you wanted to say something there. Yeah, I, 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 I had to laugh because when you talk about the dominant culture in the region, I mean, it's exactly this kind of language that drives the Arabs and the Sunnis nuts. Uh, you know, Iran is going to have, it can't have it both ways. If it wants to be part of the international community, it's going to have to behave responsibly and it's going to have to exert more energy resolving conflicts than stirring them up. And I think the same goes for Saudi Arabia. And, and that's really what, you know, the United States has to encourage well, uh, wanna... so that we don't have more yeah, can conflicts I, can I make like a this. Comment we don't here, see uh, more uh, refugees, uh, uh, you know, dying yeah. in can the I, Mediterranean. Can I make a comment here, please? Ali, you go and then William. Yes, I mean, I always tell my, my Iranian friends when they talk about this dominant civilization business. You know, uh, Iran is dominated by Islam, and Islam effectively was an Arab religion. The, the supreme leader of Iran calls himself a Sayyid, so he claims Arab ancestry. So when Iranians talk about their dominant civilization, they have been actually taken yeah. over by Arab civilization for the last 1,400 years. Just, just and they don't fire. like it one bit. <laughs> really. No, they don't like it one bit. Exactly. I want to get back to a point that Barbara <laughs> made very briefly towards the end of her uh, previous intervention, and that is that I think that the there, there's a certain responsibility uh, now on Washington's shoulders in terms of trying to figure out how to, how to manage all of this. I've said for months, certainly since uh, the U.S. started uh, airstrikes against the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, that the U.S. is facing a serious set of contradictions and uh, problems of long standing in its relationships with all the countries in the region. That is especially the case with Saudi Arabia. The good part of what has just happened is that we have seen potentially a historic turning point in terms of Saudi Arabia, which the U.S. and other Western countries has been trying to build up for 35 to 40 years as an independent bulwark, as, as, as a country that can, can take its own security matters in hand without needing outside help. Uh, we've, now seen, we've now seen Saudi Arabia do that in a meaningful way, in a more meaningful way than it's ever done before. But it's, but, but it's happening at a time when uh, the Saudis have tried to justify it and pitch it in a way that is highly disruptive to global or larger American interests in the region, which have a lot to do with what comes out in terms of U.S.-Iranian relations and the, and, the, and the ability of the United States and Iran to have a dialogue, as well as with other countries in the region, about the serious regional issues uh, that, such as Syria, Iraq, Yemen, now Yemen. But we, this is also happening as we're heading into a US election campaign. 
And in terms of keeping their focus on that part of the world, how is that going to be possible when you know, the White House is going to be clearly taken up with other matters domestically? Well, I think the, that, that's, that's a key and very valid question. And I, you know, unfortunately, uh, one of the things the United States has never been able to do uh, over the past 50, 60 years is have a, a, a reasonable, rational, and calm discussion of its interests in the Middle East. Uh, we really don't have a good way, a good, a good political culture in which to do that. And with uh, 535 self-appointed secretaries of state, uh, you know, against the real secretary of state trying to define what American policy is, plus uh, uh, plenty of our allies and friends in the region knowing exactly how to push certain buttons in Washington in order to influence the debate, I don't know that we're going to be able to do that. The point is, however, that whatever the challenges the White House will have in trying to manage this amid the cacophony of the 2016 elections, um, we have seen events recently, and we will see events in, in the coming months that should, I hope, force the United States to face up to a lot of the contradictions and incoherence of its policy so that it starts to figure out how to work with partners like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and we hope in the future, Iran. Barbara, what would you say to that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that the Iranians have made a number of interesting statements recently. The State Department here has been busy vigorously denying that there is any cooperation or coordination with Iran against uh, ISIS or al-Qaeda. Uh, but of course, we have seen the U.S. and Iran working on the same side in Iraq against uh, the Islamic State. And there, there is a, a kind of not an expectation. I think it's a very modest hope that this nuclear deal will lead to an improved relationship between the U.S. and Iran, a continuation of this very, uh, very intimate diplomatic relationship. I mean, it's quite amazing. We have no diplomatic relations with Iran, but John Kerry has been spending more time talking to Javad Zarif than any other foreign minister in the world that these connections will not go away if there is a deal, and that they will be useful uh, in terms of dealing with other issues like Yemen, like Syria, like Iraq. Now, at this point, I'm terribly sorry to tell all participants that we've come to the end of the France 24 debate. So at this point, let me thank my guests. That's William Jordan, Ardavan Amir Aslani, from London, Ali Shihabi, and also from Washington, Barbara Slavin. Thank you again, and it's time now for mm -hmm. Media Watch. Thank you. So we're leaving the Middle East and heading back here to France, which of course is dealing with the news of that foiled attack on two churches in Paris. And with me is James Creedon, our Media Watch editor, who's been sort of looking at the social media websites to see what people have been saying about this. That's right, Annette. Obviously, a lot of, a lot of coverage of this uh, thwarted attack uh, on, on churches and indeed the, the death of a woman uh, because her car was being hijacked in this whole plan. In any case, you can see their headlines in the world's press about it. Uh, uh, Le Monde, obviously, as well, uh, talking about the quite lucky uh, way in which the police were able to intervene because, in fact, the, 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 the attempt to uh, hijack this woman's car and the, the, uh, the, I suppose, fight that ensued and the fact that he ended up shooting himself, that's how the security services and the police actually got involved and this attack was foiled. So the fact that he wasn't spotted or picked up by the authorities in terms of these plans sooner has got a, quite a degree of comment. Now, you do have some people... Uh, saying bravo to the security services or to uh, the spy agencies for their professional professionalism in, in having sort of uh, picked up on this. Others saying, well, actually, uh, it happened by accident and that's not very reassuring in terms of uh, accidents <coughs> or uh, luck isn't exactly how we should be foiling terrorist plots. So it did get a quite a lot of attention in that regard. And it even led to a poll being put up on the website of the Sunday newspaper, Le Journal du Dimanche, saying, do you, have, do you trust uh, the security services? So that debate going on uh, quite a lot. Uh, a lot of people also uh, commenting on the fact that churches are 
uh, Christian churches are now seem to be targets and uh, should uh, there has been this reaction by one priest saying that they should remain open I suppose an allusion to the fact that a lot of synagogues in France are under police protection or army protection even uh, obviously uh, exp uh, an expression of sympathy as well for uh, the victim uh, with the hashtag je suis Aurélie some people picking up on the je suis Charlie meme so uh, obviously all of this reflecting the tensions since January since those attacks others saying that she indirectly saved lives in the sense that uh, her uh, struggle with this man is what uh, got the police involved. So there you go. All of this, of course, against the backdrop of uh, an attempt uh, by the uh, by the parliament to strengthen uh, to strengthen the the tools at the dis at the disposal of the security services with this new um, spy bill, which has been dubbed by critics of it the French Patriot Act. Uh, so um, I suppose against the backdrop of that, it has indeed generated quite a lot of discussion by politicians. I suppose many people saying, "Well, now you see why we need a law like this." Others saying, well, um, the fact that uh, the interior minister said uh, just last November that he wasn't going to speak publicly about any of these foiled attacks. Uh, it's interesting now to see that, there, that you know he called a press conference and that there was a huge amount of media attention about this one foiled attack. I suppose you could say there was a death involved, so it did merit some degree of, of attention. But perhaps that backdrop of this law uh, that uh, they're trying to push through is uh, interesting to point out, Annette. And finally, to Marine Le Pen, who's been included in the Time magazine's top 100 most influential people. That's right, Annette. Uh, so a lot of people are saying uh, that is this really appropriate that Time magazine would invite uh, the far-right leader to uh, a gala in midtown Manhattan at the Lincoln Centre where she's dressed as if it's uh, the Cannes Film Festival, uh, normalising her image all the more. Uh, and indeed, there has been quite a degree of criticism of that. I'll just show you one tweet where they've sort of photoshopped her head onto Kim Kardashian's body. Indeed, Kanye West was one. I think he performed at that event. So in other words, uh, is this really the road we want to be going down? in terms of the national or even international perception of a far-right leader, Annette. James Green, thanks so much for that. And that's it from us here. Do stay with us here on France 24 because Laura Cellier, rather, is going to be in the studio with more news and headlines.